So now we're on chapter 5, and things are just getting crazier. I'm so excited to tell you about all the new things to this story, but you'll just have to watch the video to see why I'm really excited about this chapter. In the original game, the sixth world was Pluto. Ironically, despite being the smallest planet, Pluto was the largest and most diverse world in the game. Entropy had a different layout, but was similarly huge and diverse. The bird music was played by a violin instrument, a melody that started out sunny and mournful, and then it gets rather, I guess I would call it, distorted. It made me feel depressed and unnerved, not something I would want to hear while trying to sleep. Strangely, none of the levels from the previous worlds were present here. Instead, there were eight brand new icons. The bosses this time were Megalon, Barra, and Mechagodzilla. As usual, the first thing I did was to go to the quiz level for another interrogation from Face. But when I got there, I noticed something different. Instead of the usual goofy Ghidorah music, it was the password theme. The music change seemed to be intentional because after the first two questions at the start, the quiz started to take on a darker tone. Do you like ice cream? Yes. Reaction. Rear face number one. Do you like clowns? Yes. Reaction. Rear face number ten. Is time slipping through your fingers? Yes. Reaction. Rear face number two. Do you have any regrets? Yes. Reaction. Hurt. Do some people deserve to die? No. Reaction. Rear face number three. Is it safe to go out at night? Yes. Reaction. Rear face number five. Do you find it hard to sleep at night? Yes. Reaction. Rear face number nine. Have you ever killed anyone? No. Reaction. Rear face number seven. Do you want to kill anyone? No. Reaction. Angry. Are you actually accomplishing anything? No. Reaction. Rear face number four. Does life have any real meaning? No. Reaction. Love. Do you like Mothra? No. Reaction. Maniacal. I knew that last one was going to be a gameplay related question, but I had no idea what the result would be. I answered honestly, because as I said before, I never liked Mothra. Nobody liked playing as Mothra in this game, and there was a good reason for that. Every other time Mothra gets hit, she gets slammed back to the left corner of the screen, and she sucks at fighting because her attacks are so weak. The only benefit Mothra had was being able to fly over obstacles in some levels. So I answered no. And Face actually replied back to me, not only with the maniacal expression, but with the text, too bad. I was taken back to the map screen, and I was shocked to see that Godzilla and Anguirus had disappeared from the board, leaving only Mafra. Face had just fucked me over. Needless to say, I was pissed. But there wasn't anything I could do, and I was willing to bet even if I had said yes, I would have been stuck with Mafra anyway. The Face giveth, and Face taketh away. I took a deep breath and got ready to explore. There were two paths I could take through the board. I decided to take the lower one. This turned out to be a good choice for reasons I'll get to momentarily. The first world ahead of me was a forest, so I started there. Almost immediately, I got an eerily feeling. There was something above this level that just seemed off for me, even more than the previous ones. Perhaps it was the pitch black background. I've always been afraid of being in a forest at night. Something about all those trees makes me feel surrounded and vulnerable, and the fact that I was stuck as Mothra didn't help. Playing the game's previous worlds as Godzilla gave me a feeling of bravery, being in control of the King of the Monsters. I'd be able to handle just about anything in my way. But it's not like that with Mothra. No feeling of strength or security. Now I'm just a weak, easily overwhelmed bug, traversing into the unknown. Back to the level. The music had new instruments, sounding like woodwinds, followed by slow, rhythmic drums and chiming bells. It gave me this feeling that I was intruding into some dangerous place I really should not be. After a while, I encountered the first enemies on the stage, or at least I assumed they were enemies. They were strange, long-legged deer-like creatures. Instead of attacking, they were just idly walking around. I went to approach them, and they ran away. I thought about shooting one with an eye beam to see what would happen, but it seemed wrong. These creatures were harmless. So I passed over them and continued through the level. About halfway through, I encountered groups of the deer like animals, and also two new creatures. A sloth-like creature with a beak climbing on a tree, and hairy raptor-esque beasts that were preying on the deer. It was very surreal watching these creatures interact. 
I didn't feel like I was playing a video game, but rather I was traveling through a forest in some other dimension. The creatures ignored me for the most part, although the raptors did attack me when I got too close, or if I attacked them first. I know I shot one of them to help one of the deer creatures escape. I got clawed at, but confrontation was easily avoided by flying up to the top of the screen. After that, I had to choose whatever I wanted to play the levels with the hourglass or the TV screen. I picked the latter. What I got was not all what I expected. When I presented the button to start a level on the TV screen like I normally would, the screen with an animation popped up. There was also music in the background, which was the goofy Gizora music that used to be playing the quiz levels. I was somewhat unsettled by this because it was just so strange. I found it a bit spooky because I had a shirt that looked just like that when I was a kid. After starting the animation, you could go back to the board by pressing any button. After that, I had no idea what to expect of the rest of these icons. I went to try an hourglass icon next. I was somewhat relieved when an actual level came up. It was certainly an unorthodox looking level, all brown with time measuring instruments flowing in the air and gigantic grandfather clocks in the background. The music was the same as the board screen, and very early in the level, I encountered something else I didn't expect to see. Original enemies from the game. And not just that, it seemed to be a whole fleet of them. And the yellow tanks, which were normally immobile, could not move. I took some damage, but it was nothing I couldn't handle. But the most interesting thing about this level was the colored hourglass items. There were three of these. A blue hourglass made time slow down and filled the level with enemies from the past. A red hourglass made time speed up and filled the level with enemies from the future. A green hourglass set time to normal speed and filled the level with the normal game enemies. I encountered a blue hourglass first. As stated, the game started to slow down and I saw the enemies from the past, which were five different types of prehistoric animals. I don't know much about prehistory, but I believe all of these enemies represent real animals. The level went into another segment, and I encountered the green hourglass, and then I fought the original enemies again. It was the same five types, so I didn't take any screenshots. But in the last segment, I encountered the red hourglass, and the enemies that must have been from the future. Now, whether or not the game was showing me 8-bit renditions of creatures that will actually exist thousands of years in the Earth's future, I have no idea. But with that thought in mind, I found this particular segment to be very eerie and it was made more intense because everything moved faster. One of the future enemies bore a striking resemblance to something I saw in a book once, called True Domain. Another looked like some kind of organic spaceship. There was only one of the fifth type of future creature, and when it appeared, all the others ran for their lives, leaving me alone to battle it. It could fly, but its sprite didn't naturally move, and its single attack was finally a lightning bolt from its face. Even so, it was surprisingly powerful, and I suppose it could be considered a mini-boss. After defeating it, it left a health power-up that restored the health and energy I had lost fighting it, which was convenient. It seemed I would need all the help I can get to beat this world with Mothra alone. After that previous stage I called Time Warp, the next stage appeared to be a toxic waste dump. As you can see, the place looked grungy and inhospital. The music was a short looping of an ambient synthesizer song. Listening to it made me feel like I had sniffed some toxic fumes myself, and it was messing with my head the whole time. I even felt like I was choking while playing this level. The enemies all seemed to be mutated to some degree. In the above screenshot, you can see green mummies with bird skulls that jump out of the waist to spit projectiles. There's also a brownish cow skeleton monster with spider legs. Halfway through the level, I even saw one of the deer from the forest. It was alone, and when I saw it, it was drinking toxic waste out of a barrel with an ant ear like tongue. I was moving over to try to make it stop, but then this flock of skull birds came out of nowhere and started attacking. The deer was scared by this and ended up riding off the ground to the toxic waste. I feel bad for it. One of the birds bit me, but I regained health quick from killing all of them. They were rather weak. I pressed onward. Of all the levels in Entropy, this was probably the most normal in that there was little deviance from the move forward smash things formula in the original game. I encountered more creatures through the level, like, like tentacle blobs and some kind of deformed thing with human-like teeth. I didn't feel like provoking them into a fight, so I kept on flying near the top of the screen. I still had to deal with occasional flock of birds now and then. 
At the end of the level was a large bluish green lake, and there I encountered another mini boss. Some kind of a monster with a long neck and a whale skull. It attacks you with a mouth projectile and by charging into you. It could also go underneath the water and rapidly emerge from a different place. It was harder to beat than the boss from the time warp, and it had a lot of health because it must have taken me 3 minutes to defeat it. It let out a really loud noise when it died, and then sank back into the water as I left the screen. Back on the board, I went to the nearest level icon I hadn't seen yet, which was the white tree. As I guessed, the level was a winter themed recolor of the forest stage, but unlike the regular forest, I didn't feel a nerve starting this one. I think the music had a lot to do with it. It was a gentle calm song. It almost sounded romantic. It was quite stress relieving, and the forest itself looked much less ominous covered in snow. I traveled through the first segment and joined the atmosphere for 4 minutes, when suddenly I realized something. I hadn't seen a single creature since I had started the level. Where are all the animals? Soon after, I left the screen and the next segment started. In the second segment, I was still in the winter forest, but now the music was gone. I was starting to feel suspicious, but then I reminded myself that there were other empty levels in the game and this was likely another one of those. But then, I heard something familiar. It was the 12 second looping music from Unforgiving Cold starting up. I could feel my heart sink as I came across this horrible sight. It was a whole group of dead deer creatures covered in snow. Judging from the blackish blue tone on the skin, they must have all frozen to death. On closer inspection, some were missing body parts. Now I was frightened, but I still had to keep going. Before exiting the level, I was really hoping to see something resembling the previous forest animals in a living state. And sure enough I did. It was a creature much like the big sloth, except this thing had white fur and was more of a big gorilla. It was walking very slowly when I saw it, but I was happy to at least see something alive. However, it didn't stay that way for long. A pack of raptors, who must have sensed that something else was still alive, came washing in from the right side of the screen. The big gorilla didn't stand a chance, as one of the raptors immediately lunged at it and ripped open its black legs. These winter raptors acted far different from the temperate relatives. While the other raptors only attacked while hunting prey or when provoked, the winter raptors seemed to have all gone sane. They attacked everything in sight. One was running back and forth, clawing at nothing. Even the noises they made sound different, more high pitched and enraged. As I left this second segment, I even saw two raptors fighting to the death. They were both covered in injuries, and one of the raptors had been blind in one eye. I took a screenshot, but I didn't stay to see who won the fight. I only had to get through one more segment before I could go back to the board screen. But in this segment, I was no longer in the winter forest, but instead a very empty grassy plain with a bright grey moon in the sky. The pleasant music of the winter forest had returned, and immediately I started to feel dread. This is going to sound crazy, but it's the absolute truth. The game made this level from one of my memories. After a long stretch of nothing, I reached the lake, and then the moon moved down from the sky and began to hatch like an egg. When it did, a curled up humanoid figure fell into the lake as the moon half quickly disintegrated. I heard a splash when it hit the wire, then a moment of silence. Then the screen began to shake, and a new creature emerged from the wire. And thus, I was introduced to a monster I called the Moon Beast. This was the only screenshot I took, as I was focusing all my concentration on winning the fight, and it was the most difficult fight yet. Stronger than any of the previous bosses, this creature would have been hard to take down with Godzilla, and with Mothra, it seemed nearly impossible. I suppose I would consider myself fortunate that the beast lacked any attacks like Gigant saw, because if I had, I would have never won this. I barely had 3 bars of health when I finally killed this abomination, but what happened afterwards is hardly what I could call reward. I've been trying to keep my promise and suppress this memory for years, but it seems as if I have to get it off my chest. This is a very painful memory for me, but the game already knows about it, and I think you should too. I'll just tell you the important parts, because I don't like bringing this experience back into my head unless I have to. Back when I was in middle school, I had a girlfriend named Melissa. She suffered from some kind of mental disorder that caused her to go into episodes. When she was in an episode, she would stand or sit perfectly straight and still, and her face would instantly lose any expression she had before. She would speak very clearly, without a hint of emotion. 
When it was over, she would start trembling and sometimes bury her face in her hands and remain silent for several minutes. I couldn't really convey the feeling it gave me in words, and I wouldn't try, but you have to see it in person to understand. But despite this, she was a very kind person and I cared about her dearly. We liked to hang out in the field at night and look at the stars. But one night, she didn't say anything to me at all. She just stared directly at the moon, trembling. I tried to talk to her, but she suddenly sprung up and ran right into traffic. I tried to stop her, but I was too late. She got hit by a truck and was killed that night. I looked her right in the eyes when the wheels went over her neck. That sight has always haunted me. I know that the game knows about this, because after I defeated the Moon Beast, this happened. After that, the game went back to the board screen. It was all I could do not to burst out screaming, and my hands were shaking so bad I could barely hold the controller. I knew the game was going to test me if I kept playing, but I had no idea it would go so far, or that I was even capable of doing what it just did. I could feel my brain going haywire as I asked myself, did the game just read my mind? That didn't seem possible, but what other explanation was there? It was then that I could no longer deny what now seemed obvious. This game is alive, and not only that, it can also establish some kind of mental connection with the player. And yet, I couldn't convince myself to stop playing. I didn't know if it was the game messing with my mind, or just my stubborn curiosity. But even with the previous revelation, I really wanted to see it through to the end. Even more than I did before I'd beat Dementia. Terrifying as it might be, even dangerous, I knew that if I quit playing, I would never be able to stop thinking about it. If I try to reset the game, it might go back to being normal again. How many people ever get to witness something like this firsthand? let alone be able to take screenshots of the whole thing. Fucked up as it was, this was the experience of a lifetime. But even so, I couldn't take any chances with my health. I had a TV remote right next to me, ready to turn the TV off in case I thought it was natural danger. And if that didn't work, I would pull the plug out of the wall, or just run out of the room. Surely that would be enough. Whatever powers the game has, it seemed to be confined to what it can show me on the TV and whatever its mental connection could do. The latter was what worried me. I still didn't know what I was dealing with, so I wasn't about to underestimate it. I took a break for a few minutes to calm my nerves, and then it was back to the game. And speaking of TVs, there was a TV screen icon right below the white forest I had just left. And because the first animation was so bizarre, I figured I'd try another to see what happens. Although I expected the same animation, I actually got a totally different one. Weird. The music for this one was the Neptune Boar music. Fain, I suppose, since it was a fish man and all. I can't help but wonder what the point of these things are. There was one more TV screen icon, so I figure it must have a unique animation of its own. I was going to make sure to see what it was before I left Entropy, but then it was time for another level. The gold brick icon was the closest thing, so I went to that, and I started up in a gold labyrinth level. My health and power were filled. Not sure how or why, but I was glad not to be heading into the unknown nearly dead. I also noticed that my Mothra sprite had shrunk to half its normal size. The music was a slow, ominous drum beat, with female vocals kicking in about a minute into it. Try haunting. The gold labyrinth itself was an anomaly. I'm not sure how this level would have played out if I was using Godzilla or Angris because flying seemed necessary just to get around this place. Another thing that caught my attention was that when you go left, your monster actually turns and faces the left. That sounds stupidly obvious, but in the original game, you were only supposed to move to the right. So when you tried to move left, your monster ended up walking or flying backwards. This level was apparently gigantic in size, because every time I thought I had reached an end to it, or thought I was going to end up back where I started, I encountered something totally new. Things like lava blockades, new enemies, and statue faces. I found one statue face at a dead end with a wide, open-eyed stare. The night Melissa died, she had an expression on her face that looked exactly like this the whole time. Even when she got hit by the truck, she still had that same expression. I could not help but feel like something really is staring at me from behind the screen while I look at this. I really don't want to be reminded of that night anymore, so I left the statue almost as soon as I found it. I needed to find the exit anyways, which proved to be no simple task. It felt like this level stretched on forever in all directions. 
I must have wandered around the level for at least 15 minutes before I finally saw something. It was a creature that wasn't gold, seemingly the only one of its kind in the level. Lacking any kind of hover ability like the other creatures, it just walked back and forth on the platform, but it wasn't long after I found it that a flying machine swooped down and grabbed it, and then flew off of it. The machine apparently had not seen me, so I decided to follow it, to see where it was taking the creature. The machine stopped at a room with a large cauldron-like object in the center. The machine hovered over to the cauldron and dropped the creature into it. The creature came and emerged from a hole in the cauldron's side, now adorned in the same gold color as everything else. The machine flew off. I'm not really sure what to make of this, but I'm glad I came upon it because I found the exit soon after. When I got back to the board, I realized that the bosses hadn't moved at all. A bit odd, but it didn't bother me. It made playing my route through Entropy easier. There were still two icons to explore, the Indigo Cliffs and a new black version of the Labyrinth. Since there were only three black Labyrinth icons, I played the Indigo Cliffs first. It was a lot like the Blue and Green Mountains. The level graphics had the same shred look to it. There's also a recolor of the clouds and moon from the Toxic Waste Dump. The music was merely a deep rumbling noise. One of the first things I encountered was these multicolored creatures with big heads emerging from a small cave in the ground. They all made a synchronized shaking sound, and they rocked to the right in a group after emerging from the cave, ignoring me. Having no other way to go, I followed them on the route. More and more emerged from the cave, until the group had about 100 creatures. Eventually, the pathway ended in a cliff. I was shocked to see that upon reaching the cliff, all the creatures began jumping off into the abyss. I've seen enemies walk off cliffs before, but I've never seen NPCs commit mass suicide like this. Very unsettling way to start off a level. I continued on, flying over various strange animals like the one shown here. Another group of multicolored bobbleheads were jumping up and down, only to be snatched by large birds, which I'm fairly certain a sprite version of the giant condor from Godzilla vs. Space Monster. I defeated some of the condors in battle, but it bothered me that these bobbleheads seemed to be so eager to die. If the game itself is alive, perhaps the creatures in these levels are also alive? And some have very unhappy lives, if this behavior is any indication. But what provokes them to do this? In the back of my mind, I also suspect that the glowing moon in the sky is the reason. At the end of the level, I saw yet another group of bobbleheads marching up to a large monster and being devoured. This was starting to disgust me, so acting on impulse, I fired off eye beams at both the monster and the bobbleheads. I destroyed the cave. The monster became angry and ran through the remaining bobbleheads to fight me. Although it lacked any ranged attacks, it was relentless. But it was no match for me. I was in the home stretch now, up to the bosses. My plan was to go through Barra first, then Megalon. After that, I would watch the last TV stream, play the Black Labyrinth before fighting Mega Godzilla, and lastly, going through the chase with the Hell Beast. I was curious to see if it would be in a new form again. But first things first, time to beat Barra. As I expected, he started off in his Lavra form. The music was Fire Ant's battle theme. Whenever the game puts in a new Godzilla Kaiju with more than one form, that other form always shows up. For a game that's otherwise inexplicable, it's rather stalling that in its consistency and accuracy with the new Kaiju bosses. The fight started off simple. Lavra Barra fought in a similar fashion as Magma did, charging back and forth and occasionally firing off lightning from its horn. During the fight, I noticed that Mothra's combat capabilities had been altered in my favor. The eye beams did twice as much damage as they did normally. Now they were as strong as Godzilla's punches. The poison power was similarly improved. It also did this nice thing where it would actually hit an enemy when they used it. In the original game, even though Mothra could fly, she was unable to fly over an opponent. You would get knocked back the same way as if you ran straight into them, which was extremely annoying. But not anymore. I could change direction and fly around, which was a big help because fighting Imago Barra is much like fighting a Claw Mothra, although Barra is distinctly faster and stronger. No longer impeded by its slow moving lava form, Imago Barra was a fearsome opponent. Although it lacked the horn lining, it now had a new, more powerful eye beam. Barra could change direction just like I could, so this battle involved a lot of flipping and flying around. It was pretty damn fun to be honest. 
So after defeating Barra, I was excited to see what Megalon would be like. For first, I went through an Indigo Cliffs level and shot through a lot of the creatures for health power-ups. So about Megalon, his music was Gigant's theme. Makes sense, since Gigant was his battle partner in Megalon's one film appearance. He was a lot like Magua, but faster and with more weapons. He'd start off charging off of his drills. I liked to fly back and forth around him, which seemed to really annoy him. After a few seconds, he'd step back, turn around, and start spitting out grenades. Those were a pain because they bounced when they hit the ground. Lastly, he started spamming his lightning beam. It only went straight forward, so it was easy to duck under it and then shoot him with eye beams. Overall, I describe him as strong and persistent, but dumb. I was now nearing the end of Entropy. I had just taken down Megalon, and I started up the last TV stream to see what I get this time. The result was unpleasant. The music for this gruesome scene was the Password theme. I couldn't figure out why this animation was so sinister and violent in comparison to the other two. The whole game seemed to be growing more malevolent. As I went on to finish Entropy, I began to feel drained. It's hard to describe, like I had suddenly became tired when I wasn't before. Most likely it was the tantrum from all that had happened in the game gained to me, but who knows. The last level type on Entropy is what I call the Shadow Labyrinth. The scenery was recolored from gold to black. The music was an evil ambulance, similar to the Unforgiven Cold Loop, but distinctly different. The music was my first sign that this level was going to be distressing. I traveled through the maze for about a minute, and I noticed that there weren't any creatures hovering around. It was an odd transition from the Gold Labyrinth, which was overwhelmed with creatures, to this level that had nothing at all. But then this might be a good thing. Maybe there wouldn't be any obstacles and I can get through this level of ease. Then the screen went dark. And immediately, I snapped out of my daze from a few seconds earlier. Everything had been darkened so that the only thing I could see was the Mothra sprite. I couldn't tell where I was going and I ended up frantically running into walls. I heard a noise, the sound of a crowd running through a hallway. And along with the running came the wars loud roaring sounds, which I would describe as something like a rabid dog the size of an elephant, screaming with fury. And I could tell that whatever was making this noise, there were lots of them. I knew there was something there, but it wasn't until I did some screen cap A that I got to see what my pursuers looked like. But at the time, I couldn't see what they were or where I was going. I was literally running blind, and this mob of beasts eventually caught up with me. All I could think was, no, as I saw my life bar repeatedly decline. The monsters had taken me down to half my total health when I was saved. The light came back on, and the attackers had disappeared. And so the challenge of this level was revealed. Find the exit before the lights go out, and a pack of monsters maul you to death. I was in panic mode now, moving as fast as I could go while trying every path I could find for a way out. As I played through the level, the lights went out a total of three times. The second time, I would have been dead meat had it not been for one of the YI statues. I stayed close to it. The monsters seemed to all avoid me until the light came back. The statue wore them away somehow. I was safe as long as I stayed near the statue, but at the same time, I had to leave to find the exit. The Shadow Labyrinth turned out to be much smaller than the Gold Labyrinth, as it only took about 6 minutes to navigate to the end. But before the exit, there was a row of halls leaning straight down, with no way out once entered. You either got to the exit before the monsters reached you, or you died. Thankfully, I made it out. Only one more boss, Mega Godzilla. I started the battle, and got something unexpected. Not only did my life shoot back up to 100% again, but instead of a replacement boss, I was fighting Godzilla. But any Godzilla fan worth the salt can figure this out. Mechagodzilla started off like fighting a clone Godzilla, but his disguise burned away after only three life bars. Usually transformation only occurred at the halfway point. At this point, it was like fighting Mechagodzilla in the normal game. It felt kinda nice to fight one of the original game enemies for a change. Although he wasn't exactly like normal, he also had a rainbow beam and finger missiles. This prevented me from doing the old trick of backing him into the corner and hitting him with eye beams in a spot where he couldn't hit me. But that was always a cheap trick anyways. But after getting him down to half his health, something weird started to happen. His sprites started to glitch in much the same way as Gazor had way back in the first world. After a few seconds, the glitches began to form a new shape. And thus, the game had created not Mega Godzilla, and I discovered that this visual glitch was somehow related to the game recreating things. 
the human face in this one gives it a very uncanny look. It was one of the stronger replacement monsters, and it had the most firepower. Pictured here is his mouth beam, which I got caught in the middle of. Even though it was a bit stronger, it was also slower than its original counterpart and couldn't jump around as much. I won the fight by consistently staying out of its flying fire, but barring the machine with poison power as I flew over it. One last thing to do, the Hell Beast Chase. Oh boy, might as well just get this over with, I thought. The Entra Beat and Chase ended up being exactly what I was afraid it would be, a labyrinth level. All the other chases, although difficult, was extremely straightforward. You just had one right and that could touch, but this took all the simplicity out of it. There was no telling how big the labyrinth would be, or where the exit was. And not only did I have to consistently backtrack to find my way out, I also had to avoid getting one hit killed by the web monster, and for those first 30 seconds, it didn't show up. But I knew it would. As I started picking up the pace, I heard a loud flapping noise. And there it was, in a flying form. It flew with bat-like wings, and was as fast and relentless as ever. For reasons already stated, this was probably the most nerve-wracking of all the end chases, and as such, I had to keep my focus on the game and not taking screen caps. However, I did take one of the red monster doing something I found very interesting. I had managed to lose it by going through a different path than I apparently expected, and it was blocked from attacking me by one of the organic walls of the red labyrinth. Or so I thought. It tried crawling through the wall for a second before opening up its mouth and tearing the wall apart with the intestine jaws. But those brief milliseconds that the monster was held back might have been the key to me finding the exit. The path to the exit was long and complex, but from what I remember, I went up and then back towards left. I'm still not sure why I chose this particular way. Just a lucky hunch, I suppose. I was swaying profusely, but my luck had saved me yet again. I hope it won one out before I finished the game. There were only two more worlds to go. Next was the penultimate world called Exus. Man, this is getting more interesting. I mean, better graphics on the worlds, these weird TVs displaying random shit, the run down radioactive cities, dead snow covered bodies that make me think of that Pokemon creepypasta, and to top it all off, we got Melissa, and that damn face at the end of the first part of Chapter 5. I bet none of you were expecting that. With Melissa, we'll know more of her in the next chapter or two, but the thing I was always wondering about was, what was Melissa always suffering from? I mean, was she a schizophrenic or something? I mean, what suddenly caused her to just randomly wind traffic like that? Was she suicidal too? It seems that Red has more control of things in the story than we gave him credit for beforehand. Well, the bright side is that my TV is working again, aside from the brief random horrific imagery that pops up every few seconds, but it's all good. Um... Maybe I should shut it off for now and uh, go read a book.